think we're almost there. So let me open us in a word of prayer and we'll begin. Father God, thank you for your word. We thank you for preserving it for us. We thank you that it is without error. We thank you that it is a safe and reliable guide for all of the the issues of this life. Help us to walk in the truth that you have revealed therein. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The, the, The topic I want to take up this morning is Paul's commandments. And um, we're going to look at some of those. And I want to start by asking you a question. I'm actually going to ask you a couple questions. And um, I don't know if these are trick questions or not, um, but they're ones you have to be, be, think about what you, the, the correct answer is. So here's the first question. Is the body of Christ under commandments during the dispensation of grace? So if we think about the dispensation of grace, the question is, is the body of Christ under commandments during the dispensation of grace? Now, I won't ask you to vote or raise your hands, But get with me, 1 Corinthians 14. Some have the natural inclination to say, well, the body of Christ isn't under commandments because God did away with those. And we live not under the law, but under grace. But think about that carefully. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you, notice what it says, are the commandments of the Lord. So is the body of Christ under commandments during the dispensation of grace? I mean, it couldn't be more obvious, is it? In other words, Paul didn't say the things I write to you, they are my own opinions. You may choose to follow them or you may not. It's all up to you. It's all good. Live your truth. That's not what he says. The things that Paul wrote were the commandments of the Lord. So is the body of Christ under commandments during the dispensation of grace? The answer is plainly yes. Here's a follow-up question. Does the body of Christ need to keep ordinances during the dispensation of grace? Slightly different question. Does the body of Christ need to keep ordinances during the dispensation of grace? So is the answer to that one yes or no? Well, look at me at 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren... That ye remember me in all things, notice, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Did Paul give ordinances to the body of Christ? I mean, it's rather plain, isn't it? If he's praising them for keeping them, then obviously there were ordinances that they were to keep. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 14. First Corinthians 14, verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. So is there an order that God has given for the body of Christ during the dispensation of grace? And the answer is yes. Let me give you a couple simple examples. People sometimes have the idea they balk at being under commandments and they balk at being under ordinances. Commandments and ordinances are healthy things for you to obey. Let me give you an example. What would happen if when you get out on the road, you just pick whichever side speaks to you? You want to drive on the left, I want to drive on the right. 
what would happen? Be chaos. You, you, you need to do things in life in a way where there is order. It's for the good of society. It's for the good of the, the church. You just, it, it's just how it is. When, when you teach your children, do you ever say to them things like, do not go into the street? Are you doing that? Because you want to be a totalitarian over their liberty? Or are you doing that because it's prudent? Because it's safe? Because it's designed for their benefit, for there to be a boundary there? Don't cross that line because you cross that line and go into traffic. What do you risk? You risk harm, don't you? So ordinances can be for your benefit. Look with me at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Now what you may be thinking in the back of your mind is, well, wait a minute, what doesn't Romans 6 tell us? We're not under any of these things? Well, look with me at Romans 6 verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So how do we reconcile the verses we've just looked at? Because we clearly saw that what Paul wrote are the commandments of the Lord. That was clear in 1 Corinthians 14. We clearly saw in 1 Corinthians 11 that the body of Christ was to keep ordinances, but yet Paul says in Romans 6, we're not under the law. Well, actually, this isn't that complicated to, to explain. When Paul says, we're not under the law, what specific law was he talking about? The law of gravity? You remain under the law of gravity today, don't you? I mean, you can choose to opt out, but it won't quit applying. What law is Paul talking about? He's talking about the Mosaic law, isn't he? We're not under the Mosaic law today. But are there commandments that Paul wrote? Plainly, there are. Get with me Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That's a reference to circumcision. Notice verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances... For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. What is it that Paul is talking about having been abolished? It's the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law is not something that the body of Christ is under, but is the body of Christ under the commands that Paul wrote and the ordinances that he delivered? And the answer is obviously yes. Otherwise, I mean, have you, have you ever read Paul's epistles? Are there things in there that he tells you to do? Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. That's a command, isn't it? Paul says, flee fornication. That's a command. He says, pray without ceasing. That's a command. In fact, if you just read Paul's epistles, what are they full of? Commands, right? Did God just write things in the Paul's epistles and says, listen, just do whatever you feel like, right? Just whatever seems good to you, just go for it. I'll be okay with it. Is that what he says? Or are there very specific instructions as to how we are to live? Well, the point obviously is Paul wrote commandment after commandment, and those are for our benefit. So what I'd like to do today is I want to cover some of Paul's commandments that I think are just very helpful in living a, a spiritually productive life. So get with me 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice evermore. What is the subject of that sentence? 
Okay, so there's really two choices. You can go with rejoice, or you can go with evermore. The subject is you, right? So you remember this from grade school. If I say, shut the door, shut is a verb, the door is a direct object, the subject is you. So in other words, when I say shut the door, it's who I'm looking at that is the subject, right? It's the understood you. Well, when it says rejoice evermore, the subject is you. Paul's writing to the Thessalonians. What he's doing is, is he's, te- he's giving them a command, right? He's instructing them to do something. He's saying you rejoice evermore. Now, it's a short verse, really simple, but let's just make sure we understand it. Scripture never commands us to be happy because happiness depends upon circumstance. You're all familiar with the word happenstance. Happenstance describes the fact that things just happen. As you go through life, Are there going to be days where you just get a flat tire? When you get a flat tire, did God say, Steve must have a flat tire, right? I have decreed that on this day his tire must be flat. Well, he could do do that if he wanted to, but Ecclesiastes says time and what happeneth to all? Time and chance. Are there a lot of things that happen just because they happen? Yeah, there are. There's plenty of things like that on earth. The reason why Scripture never commands us to be happy is because since time and chance happeneth to all, is everything that happens to you going to be a happy event? It's not. You're going to have flat tires in life and things more significant than flat tires, right? You may have work troubles. You may have financial troubles. You may have health troubles. Do you sometimes have troubles with family, right? There's just troubles on this earth because God cursed the earth, Genesis 3. Every single person you interact with has a sin nature, and you have a sin nature. So what do you think is going to happen in this little microcosm of the earth itself is cursed and every being on it has a sin nature? Are we going to just exist in blessed harmony? Life is going to have problems. Scripture never commands us to be happy because the circumstances may be difficult at times. Maybe not every day, but some days are going to be. And yet... Paul does command us to rejoice evermore. When Paul says rejoice evermore, that is not the power of positive thinking. Did did anyone ever read the book, The Power of Positive Thinking? Me too. And the idea here is, if you put happy thoughts into your mind and you get rid of all the bad thoughts, then life will be grand. Does it work that way? See, you can't just pretend away the problems of life, right? You can put all those happy thoughts in your life. That doesn't mean that there won't be car accidents and drug, dr- drunk drivers and sicknesses and so on. Those things exist on the earth we have. What 1 Thessalonians is really about, 1 Thessalonians 5.16, when it says rejoice evermore, Joy is the positive emotion connected with the acquisition or expectation of good. Joy is the positive emotion connected with the acquisition, you already have it, or the expectation of good. Do you have reason to expect that you will receive good? You do. 
In fact, you have really sort of beyond expectation, you have certainty. When Paul says rejoice evermore, and by the way, Paul talks about joy more than anyone else in the scriptures. He was also imprisoned more than anyone else in the scriptures. Well, how'd that work? Because what, what Paul deals with is from an earthly external perspective, his life is always falling apart. He keeps being imprisoned. According to 2 Corinthians 11, how many times was Paul shipwrecked? Three times. Now think about that, because, by the way, how many people on earth do you survive, think survived three different shipwrecks? Right? Now when Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 11, he says it in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is written in Acts 20. So actually, Paul was shipwrecked more than three times because you can read about an additional shipwreck after Acts 20 in the book of Acts. What am I saying? Paul's imprisoned all the time. He keeps suffering shipwreck. He's in perils of false brethren. His life, externally, circumstantially, is always a mess. Right? It, it was. But what was the truth inwardly? What did Paul know beyond a doubt? Paul knew who he was in Christ. He knew what the end score was. And the stuff along the way didn't bother him. I'll give you a simple example. You ever watch a football game with your favorite team? And the team is getting blown out. And you're like, hmm, this is not good. I don't like this. And they come back and they win miraculously. And so you go from depth to height, right? Well, when you're down here, you're like, this is bad. I don't like this. What happens when you rewatch that same game? What happens when you rewatch that same game? It's 21 to 6 in the first half. You know the end result. So are you down in the dumps or do you know how it ends? See, what, what happened with Paul, Paul realized, yeah, my earthly circumstances are always a mess. I always have some problem. Someone's trying to imprison me or kill me or... They're tearing apart the churches I establish. By the way, when Paul describes his thorn in the flesh, what does Scripture say that his thorn is? It specifically says it's the messenger of Satan. It doesn't say it was eye trouble or anything like that. It says it was the messenger of Satan. So here's my opinion. You can decide for yourself. If you realize that Satan is a counterfeiter, he's specifically described as the adversary. What would you do if you're Satan and you realize God has chosen this singular apostle of the Gentiles? And what he does is he goes on these missionary journeys and he travels around and around and he establishes churches. What would be the logical thing to do if you're Satan? Well, what you do, and I think this is what Scripture indicates happened, is you have your own guy, and what he does is he follows Paul's itinerary one step behind. In other words, Paul goes to Corinth and establishes a grace church there. Well, what I'll do is let me just wait. He leaves, and I'm going to go in and destroy it. And then he'll go to Ephesus, and then I'll do that. 2 Corinthians 11 describes Paul's thorn in the flesh as a messenger. So they have a message of Satan. So Paul was so bothered by that, he besought the Lord how many times? Thrice, right? To get rid of it. And God didn't do it because his grace was sufficient. My point is, Think about what's happening. 
God gives Paul the dispensation of grace. He has to make all men see, according to Ephesians 3.9. What Paul prays for, he doesn't say, give me a faster car. He doesn't say, give me a better chariot. He just says, look, the guy that keeps tearing up the stuff that I build, make him quit. So it's Mother's Day, let me ask you this. Has any mother ever had the experience of, you clean the house, you get it exactly the way you want it, and what promptly happens next? Is that the way it works? Sure. I've seen that happen. I know how that is. Well, that's what happens to Paul. He travels around. He plants these churches. He does his best to get them established in the truth. And what happens? The messenger of Satan comes along and tries to tear it up. That's what the book of Galatians is about. When Paul says, I marvel that ye are so... What's the next word? Soon removed. In other words, guys, I was just there. I taught you this. You've already departed. What are you doing? The point is, externally, everything is falling apart. And yet, could Paul rejoice evermore? Yes, because he knows how it ends. And if you know how it ends, the bumps in the middle don't matter. Whether they're financial problems or health problems or interpersonal problems or whatever, they're just speed bumps along the way. They don't change the ultimate destination. You're in 1 Thessalonians. We spent a lot of time on two words there. Let's look at verse 17. Pray without ceasing. That verse means what it says. Pray without ceasing. I'll tell you one of the things that I observe happens in life. People come to understand the grace message. And they, they reach the conclusion that God is in heaven and he sort of lets things play out on earth however they play out. And then they will say that God doesn't intervene in the circumstances of life. And that's the word that's often used, intervene. Intervene is not a Bible word. When you intervene into something, you interject yourself in a position that you don't belong. Right? If you intervene into a situation, you are asserting yourself into a situation where you didn't belong. I don't like the word intervene used in reference to God for a couple reasons. The first is, it's not a Bible word just a word that people use. The second is, is it even possible for God to intervene in a situation he doesn't belong? What does 1 Corinthians 10 tell you about the earth? 1 Corinthians 10, 26. For the earth is the Lord's. Get the, let's just turn there. I want you to see it. 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26. First Corinthians 10, 26. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Verse 28. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So trick question. Who does the earth belong to? It's God's. It never ceased to be His. Who created the earth, by the way? Colossians 1.16 indicates that the Lord Jesus Christ created the earth. Well, let's just, let's just turn there. Colossians 1.16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. For by Him... That's a reference to Jesus Christ, verse 13. It talks about the dear son. 
For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. So whose are they? They're His. They never ceased to be His. They are His. They will always be His. Is Satan a usurper for a period of time? Sure. Is Satan the god of this world in that the world worships him? Yes. But who do you, do you think God just said, okay, you can have the earth, it's yours, I give up? It's his. That's the point. So God's not intervening when it already and always belonged to him. You see the point? It's crazy talk to say he's intervening, it's his. You can't intervene in your own stuff because it is your stuff. So, when Scripture says, pray without ceasing, here's what happens. People sometimes get the idea, well, God isn't intervening. God isn't doing anything. And so, therefore, there's no real point to pray. And part of the reason, one of the things that also relates to that is the following. Much of our prayer life is just give me stuff, right? We're honest about the way that we pray. Look with me at Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4. Verse 6, be careful for nothing. In other words, don't be full of care, don't be overwhelmed about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What I think Philippians 4 tells you is that God has designed prayer as the pressure relief valve of your spiritual life. So let me be more specific. Do you ever find yourself in a situation or circumstances where you find them overwhelming? Where this is a big mess I don't know what to do with it. This is a real problem. Well, what should you do? Based upon Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be careful for nothing, so don't be overwhelmed by it. Okay, easy to say, but how do you do that? In everything, in every situation, in every circumstance, what what do you do? By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. Here's what that's saying. You can make your request be made known unto God. God, help me with this situation. This is overwhelming to me. I need your help in resolving it. So I can let my request be made known unto God. I should do that, according to verse 6, with thanksgiving. Here's what happens. Sometimes we look at the situation and we say, Oh, woe is me. This is so bad. This is so terrible. Well, pause for a minute. If you're accepted in the beloved, if you're complete in him, if you have how many spiritual blessings in heavenly places? All. Then literally there's nothing that can happen that's that bad. Can you die? Yeah. Can you get an incurable disease? Yes. Can you be paralyzed? Yes. Can you be imprisoned? Yes. Will any of those things matter after the first second of eternity? So what that then means, if we're just being honest about things, is, yeah, bad things can happen to you in a limited, temporal, earthly sense, but really, should you sweat it? No. And that's why, when we pray about things, we should pray with thanksgiving, because... You're already more than conquerors in Christ, 
Romans 8 tells you that. So there's nothing that can happen that is really that serious. Now, there's things that are serious in an immediate temporal, earthly sense, right? They're an immediate problem that has to be addressed. But even if they don't get addressed at all, is everything going to be okay? It is. That's why fundamentally we need to be a thankful people. If I'm being, let's just be honest, we're sort of whiners. We're complainers. God, the government is terrible. Yeah, it, it is. He knows. He's fully aware of it. That's why he's going to set up a new one. Right? By the way, man's government has been bad for a long time. Hasn't it? What happened with the first pair of brothers? We think about the good old days. In the 50s, this is what they say. The biggest problem was chewing gum in class. That's what they say. Do you really believe, with man's sin nature, that the biggest problem in the 50s was chewing gum in class? Are you that naive? What do you think happened in the 1940s in the world? There was like a big event. Anyone remember it? There were literally millions of people that were slaughtered. So were the good old days really that good? No, they never were because since Genesis 3, what has been the case for all of mankind? They have a sin nature. It's the reality of it. Get with me, got 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll do one or two more. Actually, get, get 2 Corinthians 10. I want to say something else about prayer, praying without ceasing. Get 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. And let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14. And by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. For the sake of time, I'll just put it this way. You know, there, there's a couple different aspects of prayer. Philippians 4 is the aspect of prayer, which is, how do you deal with the problems of life? How do you unburden yourself of the pressures that, that you feel. In verse 7, when it talks about, in the peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, what, what happens in Philippians 4 is, I have this problem, it's too big for me, I let my request be made known with thanksgiving, and what I've really done is I've said, look, this problem is too big for me, it's yours. And then I can have the peace of, it's been committed into God's hands, so it'll be dealt with appropriately, and whatever the outcome is, it'll be okay. What 2 Corinthians 9 tells us is this, 2 Corinthians 9. And by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. The idea there is praying for the saints that God's grace would be manifested in their lives. I could pray for all of you that God gives you a new and better car. And I, and I hope he does. But I don't think they'll just fall out of heaven and be in the driveway. But what God is really doing today, what he's really intending to do in your life, is he wants his grace to be a bigger part of your life. The answer of, of uh, to, the, the way to find contentment in this life is for God's grace to be a practical reality in your life. That's what it is. You have to understand it. You have to choose to walk in it. Let's do one more. Let's do Philippians... Oh, let's do two more. Get Philippians chapter 2. 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do all things. That's a command, isn't it? Do all things without murmurings and disputings. You want to know the, one of the most common things on the earth? Yeah, I'll do what you told me to do. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Right? Complain, whine, moan. And it's not the way God would have us to act. It says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. That's just something we need to be better at. We need to be better about having a positive attitude, and we need to be better about following that command. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 5. We'll do this as the last one. 1 Thessalonians 5. And look with me at verse 21. This is one that is particularly important as Bereans. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Prove all things. And the idea there of prove all things is that you, you test it, you validate it. You, you prove whether or not it's tr- it is true. Get Acts 17, verse 11. I'll tell you one of the, the modern dangers, one of the modern ways that this is an issue. Look with me at Acts 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Just be honest with you about what happens today. 2 Timothy talks about heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears. What happens with a lot of modern church life is it's conducted through the internet. It's just the reality of that. And when you, when you watch videos, like for example on YouTube, when you watch a video on YouTube, what is YouTube's objective? What do they care about? Well, they care about sound doctrine. And that's why they've eliminated all the stuff that's false. You know that, right? They don't care about that at all. What is their goal? Their goal is to keep you on their website for as long as possible. Right? Because they want to sell, they want to basically earn advertising revenue. That's what they're doing. Their goal is to keep you on the website for as long as they can. When they give you recommended videos, have they screened those that they're accurate? Have they even screened those that they're the same content? They're not. Not at all. And in fact, they don't need to do this. It's not their model. But what I'm saying is, if you watch certain grace preacher, it will recommend to you other other people to watch. That recommendation doesn't mean that they're saying the same thing. You realize this, don't you? They could be saying the opposite thing. But it's directing you to someone else where they're just hoping you'll watch the site. They don't care whether you come to any understanding or not. They just want you on their site. Now, why do I tell you all that? Because here's what happens. And I've seen this happen time and time and time. You watch one grace preacher, one teacher, and it recommends to you another. And people say, well, let me see what this guy says. And they think that is doing research. That's not research. That's not proving all things. That's being a spectator. 
In order to prove all things, what did the Bereans do? They searched the scriptures. They didn't watch another video. They searched the scriptures whether those things were true. I, I tell you all this because here's what's going on, and you can just see it. It's, it's a reality. People listen to one person. That person may be true, maybe not. YouTube suggests another one. And so what happens is they cycle through a series of videos. Well, if 2 Timothy 4 is correct about having itching ears and they heap to themselves teachers, 2 Timothy 4 says both those things are true, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is this. You cycle through those until you find someone that scratches your ears the best. It doesn't mean they're, the, they're accurate. They can be full of baloney. But if they scratch your ears real nice, oh, that's good, I like that. Right? And then you purr and you're like, oh, I need some more of this because, oh, my ears feel so good. It has nothing to do with what's true. It just appeals to your flesh. I'm just being honest with you. When 1 Thessalonians 5 says, prove all things, you know what that means. What it means is, there is no substitute. There is no shortcut. You've got to prove it yourself. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. We're almost done. Have you read the book that talks about, you've heard of this book, The 4-Hour Workweek? There's someone that has this book, and he has this method, and what happens is, once you master this method, you only have to work four hours a week. You know what that is? That's the same as six-minute abs. In other words, it's get rich quick. In other words, here's how you can look like Adonis, and you only have to work out three minutes a day. That's not real. That, that's just not real. Life doesn't work that way. Six-minute abs is not real. The four-hour work week is not real. Because you can't get a... There's no getting away from doing the actual work that produces the result. Okay? Now, the reason I tell you that is, and you may not like to hear this, but I'm just going to be honest with you. When Scripture talks about proving all things, there's no shortcut to it. When it says the Bereans search the scriptures daily, what we wish it said is they search the scriptures 15 minutes and we're done. Because they found the answer and they found the one teacher they could trust and they could rely on everything he said. No. You have to search the scriptures daily. And I, I tell you that honestly just for your own self-defense, right? Right? I hope I'm not going to lie to you, but will I have everything right? I'm sure I don't. Just because my own understanding is imperfect, right? My own understanding is limited. I grow. I don't agree with things I said a couple years ago because I've learned I was wrong. So my, my encouragement to you is this. Search all things. Hold fast that which is good. Okay, so I'm going to close up with, with this. So we have the drafts there. I would encourage you to grab one. I'd encourage you to take a look at 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, make notes, and then next week we're going to go through it together as a group, and um, I look forward to that exercise with you. Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its truthfulness. We thank you that it's been preserved for us. We thank you for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that gave us salvation as a free gift. We pray, Lord, that we would be busy this week about your work, that we would be in the word, that we would be studying, and that we would be the witness to the world around us that you want us to be. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll, uh, we'll sing together.